Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy visiting professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism and exercise and health. And what I'm actually wanting is for you to get your information about exercise from the exercise researchers who are experts in the field rather than from influencers. And indeed today I bring to you Professor Eric Richter from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. is my uh, great collaborator who I've been working with now uh, during four research visits. He is the absolute uh, godfather, the expert on glucose metabolism during exercise. So for over 40 years, he's been looking at regulation of glucose uptake with contraction, the effect of exercise on insulin sensitivity, so he was the first person to show that contraction can increase glucose uptake into muscle independent of insulin. But at the same time, he showed that exercise can increase insulin sensitivity. We also talked about how exercise may affect appetite. So there's evidence that especially high intensity exercise can reduce your appetite for a, a period of time. So we talked about what might be regulating that. We find that he's an absolute wealth of knowledge and uh, just really easy to listen to, easy to take on board what he's talking about. I think you'll find it really interesting. So stick around. Hello, Eric. Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thanks for coming on. How are you? Thanks. Oh, I'm fine. Thank you very much, Glenn. Looking forward. It's a, it's a funny situation because for those that don't know, I'm um, actually uh, visiting Professor in Eric's lab uh, and this is like the fourth visit. So we're just like chatting out like two minutes ago and then we come in and put on the Zoom stuff. So um, it's great yeah. being here. So yeah, my fourth, I had uh, five weeks in 2013, six months, 2016, 19 and, and now. So it's great hanging out and doing um, the research sort of stuff we'll be talking about. So interactions between exercise and insulin, which we'll be talking about at length. But um, what I like doing is um, is getting a bit of a background. So if we think, right back to when you, you know, how did you first get into this? Were you like a, a sports sort of exercise type person or did you, I know you were a medical doctor. Did you get into medicine and then think you might want to do exercise? How did you actually get into all this? Hmm. Well, it, it started in, in, uh, in medical school when I had physiology class and uh, I was quite interested in cardiovascular physiology at first. That's been an interest that I've maintained actually all my life, but I went to the uh, lecturer and and asked if he could, if he had time to uh, use a medical student in his uh, research lab, and he said, "Well, not really, but I know somebody who might be interested." And he referred me to Henry Galbo, who was a young upcoming star at the time and doing exercise endocrinology, and that was actually quite interesting also it was a fairly new field at the time back in in the late 70s actually um so i i i did some studies with him and the first couple of studies we did were actually with uh, jens holst who you might know mm. because he is a discovery of uh, discoverer of uh, glp1 and of course this has had a major impact on on clinical uh, treatment of diabetes and our obesity. And um, he was interested in glucagon at the time. And, and we were then thinking about whether glucagon secretion during exercise actually has a role in regulating hepatic glucose production. So we treated, uh, we treated mice, we anesthetized mice with ether at the time. And then I made a cardiac puncture into the, into the rat heart and then injected uh, glucagon anti-serum or control serum and then we let the rat wake up uh, very quickly because ether doesn't last that long and then uh, we exercised them and uh, then looked again at the liver glu uh, glycogen concentration actually it showed that that uh, glucagon when you neutralize glucagon the decrease in hepatic glucose uh, and the hepatic glycogen concentration was actually less. So glucagon has an effect, at least in the rat, on uh, glycogen breakdown in the liver. So that was, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the funny thing is that the publication that came out of, of this research in glucagon, there were other uh, 
we did some other studies as well, looking at glucose uh, control and so on. But it came out in JCI, mm -hmm. and it was my first publication, and I ended up as last author, which was kind of uh, interesting, at least in these days, because, I mean, the last author is usually the, the head of the lab. But uh, mm -hmm. So my first publication was the last author one in JCI. Wow. <laughs> It's a journal so anyway, of clinical investigation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a great yeah, yeah. journal. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is. So uh, so then, uh, but but uh, the main focus of my work with Henrik was actually on the uh, sympathoadrenal system in regulation of, uh, of glycogen breakdown in muscle, not so much in liver. Mm. And uh, we did some uh, studies in rats. I developed a technique to destroy the adrenal medulla in a rat without destroying the cortex so that they were unable to secrete epinephrine. And sure enough, in the rat, when you exercise the rat, if it doesn't have epinephrine, it breaks down less glycogen in the muscle during exercise. So we then uh, we then had uh, the idea to look at isolated muscle. And uh, isolated muscle was, uh, we thought of a model that uh, was developed by Neil Ruderman in Boston, mm. the isolated perfused rat hind limb preparation where you put in catheters in the aorta and the in the vena cava inferior, and then you can perfuse the hind limbs of a rat, and you can of course control what's in the perfusate, and you can then measure glucose uptake or whatever you want to do across the hind limbs. So um, I went to Boston. And was a research. Uh, it was af after my uh, after my medical degree, and did a, a fellowship with the new Ruderman, and did some work on epinephrine, also in isolated muscle, and that was all very fine. And uh, but Neil is an endocrinologist, and he works uh, clinically as well, and uh, he uh, also had di has a diabetes clinic at the. Uh, Boston University Medical Center. And uh, he, uh, we all knew, of course, that if you're an insulin-treated diabetes, diabetic patient, then you are sometimes prone to hypoglycemia, uh, not only during exercise, but also following exercise, several hours after exercise. Mm -hmm. and at the time, it was not really known how, how, what the mechanism was behind this. So Neil, and I talked about it, and then we we discussed well whether it could be the muscles that actually increase the insulin sensitivity following exercise. And that is uh, that we then uh, went on to test in a in a rat study where rats were either exercised or non-exercised, and then we perfused the muscles with different insulin concentrations. And sure enough, I guess that was the first time that we really showed that insulin sensitivity of skeletal muscle was enhanced following exercise, at least uh, at least in the rat. And that was also published in JCI and was, I guess, the first study that really set me on to look at insulin, insulin sensitivity, insulin action in muscle in combination with exercise. So that was, that was mm. what set me wow. off for the study in uh, in Neil's lab. A lot of uh, classic studies there. I wonder if we can try and, because um, I know myself trying to write grants and things, explain, explaining to the to the to the person writing the grant, uh, reading the grant, and then the, you know the people listening now, how you know glucose regulation, insulin regulation, um, how you know talking about what regulates glucose uptake during exercise, for example. And then saying how it's different to insulin, but then saying, oh, but at the same time, exercise increases insulin sensitivity. You know, it, it becomes sort of hard to <laughs> hard to explain. Do you want to just take people through that a little bit about regulation of glucose uptake during exercise? And then what insulin does at rest, and then, you know, and then how after exercise, et cetera. Mm, long story. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So I mean, when muscle contracts you uh, elicit some molecular signaling that is uh, that leads to translocation of the GLUT4 glucose transporters from the inside of the muscle to the muscle uh, membrane, the surface membrane, and the T-tubules in, in the muscle. Mm. 
-hmm. And that is a mechanism that is independent of insulin. And we actually also showed that because at the time when I was in Neil's lab, it was thought that uh, there had to be a so-called permissive effect, uh, permissive concentration of insulin in the blood for mm. contractions to actually work. And we thought that was a pretty, uh, I didn't think it was really going to be that way. So we actually showed that if you completely remove insulin from the circulation in either in vivo or in the perfused system where you can do it very easily, then muscle contractions that were stimulated electrically would still increase glucose uptake quite a lot. So. There are mechanisms that are, and we can talk about what they might be, but there are mechanisms that in the muscle, when they contract, sets off this uh, translocation of GLUT4 to the surface membrane and the T tubules. And of course, there's also in vivo a large increase in blood flow. So that provides a lot of delivery of glucose to the muscle, and therefore you get a, a quite robust increase in glucose uptake. And it can actually increase up to a uh, hundred fold more than you see at rest if if the conditions are at maximal exercise and in vivo and so on so it's a really a really powerful mechanism and it's it's interesting because because it is independent of insulin it also works in patients with uh, diabetes mm -hmm. and also both uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients so exercise works uh, fairly uh, very well in uh, in in patients that are insulin deficient. Exactly. So that's that's, that... that's, sorry, I was just yeah. going to say that's the important thing. Like often people, um, if you talk to, I don't know, your average medical doctor, they might think exercise is good for people with type 2 diabetes because it causes weight loss, et cetera. But sure. not necessarily realizing that every bout of exercise increases glucose uptake during the exercise. And right. also, as I'm sure you were about to say, increases the insulin sensitivity after exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 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 the contraction-induced glucose uptake doesn't last that long. It lasts. It depends on the intensity and the duration of the exercise, but it's usually gone within a few hours, two to three to four hours. But then there's another effect, and that is that insulin then works much better in a muscle that has exercised compared to one that hasn't exercised, and that's probably the basis for the clinical problems that we know type 1 diabetic patients have many hours after exercise if they are not conscientious or conscious about uh, the uh, the problems with increased insulin sensitivity after exercise and that can last at least 24 and then the longest we've seen published is 48 hours following a single bout of exercise you can mm -hmm. have increased insulin sensitivity that was published by uh, Koi Mikines in Henry Galbo's lab many years ago. Mm. So just to clarify that people are aware of what you're saying there. So yeah, if you're a person with type one diabetes and you're, you know, you're measuring your glucose with finger pricks or continuous glucose monitoring or whatever, and then you exercise, um, you know, your, your muscle will be more sensitive to insulin for the next 24 to 48 hours. And they've got to be mm -hmm. careful not to get a, a hypo, so a reduction in their glucose. And apparently that's part of the reason why, so I've had Michael Riddell on, and he was saying that's part of the reason why it's hard. You know, it's hard enough to get people to exercise anyway, but mm -hmm. people with type 1 are worried about getting this this hypo. Um, yeah. And I wonder if we can just touch on that, that, that the fact that when you're during exercise, you're releasing glucose from the liver. You know, obviously, assuming you're fasted, if you've been eating, you'll get, glucose from the liver and also some from the gut and then your muscles taking it up and the glucose may not actually change right? but it doesn't mean nothing's happening as you said you can get up to a hundred fold increase but even if, if you do high intensity exercise so thinking again with the type 1 diabetics why don't you just say what can happen with with high intensity exercise to glucose concentrations as well yeah so so normally if you if you if you do moderate exercise the plasma glucose concentration stays pretty much at the fasting level. But if you do a very high intensity exercise, it actually increases quite a lot. And also both in, in, in people without diabetes, but also in people that have type one diabetes. And uh, 
and a, a particularly in well-trained athletes, if they really hit, <laughs> if they really do high intensity exercise, you can get, you can see glucose concentrations reaching 10 uh, millimolar. So uh, in the blood during exercise and it, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it stays up for a while. Um, mm -hmm. So there's in that situation, there is a, you could say maybe a mismatch between the uh, hepatic glucose production and the utilization in the muscles. At least it looks like the the signaling to the liver is is more than is actually needed to maintain euglycemia. Uh, yeah. And, and why is that? I don't know. <laughs> it's do, you, just, do, you think uh, it, do you do you think it might be so the muscle gets the gets a go at it, you know, while it's while it's elevated to to increase its glucose uptake or well, I yeah. guess you're saying the first few hours it's not really insulin. Mm. So I guess yeah. then it's you got to be careful. So again, with Michael Rodell was saying how it's confusing for someone with type one diabetes because their glucose is elevated and they might think, oh, I've mm. got to take a shot of insulin, but mm. their muscle will be be more sensitive to insulin. So that's really yeah. a situation yeah. they've got to be careful not to have a hypo. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So so you were talking about how the exercise increases insulin sensitivity for 24 to 48 hours. Um, can I ask, I don't think it's been looked at that much, but is it the same pretty much? So, you know, how you said people with type two diabetes have normal glucose uptake during exercise. Do they also mm. get a normal increase in insulin sensitivity after exercise yeah, or it, after it, an acute it, bout? Yeah, it hasn't been, been researched that much, but the, the studies that are out there uh, suggest that type two diabetics also get a good increase in insulin sensitivity following exercise. So, so yeah. Which is great. Okay. So I don't know, did you want to talk about, because uh, it's always interesting, you know, what, what we've been doing together, et cetera, is looking at regulation, of these things. Mm -hmm. um, did you want to talk about regulation of glucose uptake during exercise, regulation after exercise, other, I don't know. Um, yeah, so sure. The stuff, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, so during exercise there, uh, in the muscle, there is uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of molecular signaling going on during exercise and that is you know the as you know the most prevalent signaling is probably phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of various enzymes and proteins in the muscle and some years ago we published together with david james in in australia that the phosphoproteome of muscle right after in, in exercise compared to before exercise, where we actually discovered that more than a thousand proteins in the muscle had changed their phosphorylation status just mm -hmm. during 10 minutes of fairly high intensity exercise. And that was a staggering number because yeah. we, we knew, of course, some of the signaling that was going on in kinase, for instance, and chem kinase and stuff. But getting this whole list of, of 1,000 proteins that changed the phosphorylation status uh, just by 10 minutes of exercise was really, really an eye-opener. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it led mm -hmm. to discovery of several new players in the field. So a lot of uh, several new AMP kinase targets and other targets that uh, seem to play a role in, in uh, exercise metabolism and, and also in, in muscle development and so on. Um, so what actually uh, what actually regulates glucose uptake during exercise is, is not so easy as you know to 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 know because uh, the way I view it these days is that there are many mechanisms that are activated that potentially lead to increased glucose uptake so that means glut four translocation and some of them are probably redundant so if you take out one mechanism then some of the other ones will just mm -hmm. compensate so i think that's that's the way we we look at it and i guess one of the more recent discoveries that that we've done in in this uh, department with, with carlos and uh, thomas jensen was that the reactive oxygen species uh, are important for activating glucose uptake and that is also via and that also involves rack one that we've been working with for quite a while with uh, with lucas Sulo and also uh, thomas so rack one is a is a component of 
of the uh, enzyme NOx2 that makes the reactive oxygen species. And these somehow, and we, I don't think we know the mechanism exactly, but somehow leads to GLUT4 translocation in muscle during exercise and is, is part of the signaling that leads to increased glucose uptake during exercise. AMP kinase has also been involved for many years and, and it's been quite uh, back and forth. And I know you don't think that it it, play, it plays a role. And I, I know there are a lot of studies in knockout mice that show that, that if you knock out AMP kinase, you still have a normal glucose uptake in the mouse, in the muscles. But there are actually also a few studies that show that, that it's not completely normal. Uh, so uh but but it's what about humans clear. what about humans <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's yeah. right so so i know you've shown that that uh, if you're a well trained subject you can still uh, take up a lot of glucose without seeing any activation of amp kinase so so that's of course also talks or speaks against its role um but uh, jan wojtaszewski and uh, and Rasmus Krips that have quite convincingly shown that at least it regulates glucose uptake following exercise in mm -hmm. kinase. Um, so I don't know. My view is probably that it it in in most situations it it may play a role during exercise, but it's not essential, and it can be substituted quite quite easily by other mechanisms. But I mean, it, it's. You know, mm -hmm. when you're in, in, a, in a resting muscle, if you activate AMP kinase pharmacologically, glucose uptake goes up because there's GLUT4 translocation. So it would seem logical, and that's what we've been thinking yeah, for yeah. many years, that, that of course, it, it, it's part of the mechanism. But I guess it's controversial, and, and I guess most of the, of the findings suggest that it doesn't, it's not necessary at least, but, it, you, know, you know, it might. Yeah, contribute. well, it's been an interesting um time isn't it i mean we've we, we, we've been all trying to work this out for years and you know years and years yeah. ago I was, I was um talking to you about coming over and infusing nitric oxide synthase inhibitors during exercise mm -hmm. and all sorts of things and we we're looking at AMPK and yeah i assumed AMPK as well you know we did studies with as you say with acar and it increases glucose uptake yeah. by activating APK. and if you're if you have a knockout mouse uh then then you don't get the increase in gl glucose uptake with um with a car activating because you can't activate ampk whatever but yeah it seems we were talking the other day in the corridor you know myself you jan what it's kind of weird because at one stage we were doing looking at nitric oxide and you have an endos knockout and it's got glucose up, normal glucose uptake during exercise and then you have like you think cam kinase and you have a cam kinase knockout as normal glucose uptake during exercise and ampk knockout as normal so as you say Sounds like it may be right under sea, yeah. But um, yeah. and and the stuff that you mentioned, Carlos. So he was on podcast a few weeks ago. So that's really interesting stuff with the reactive oxygen species. Okay. Now you mentioned the phosphoproteome. So make just making sure people are clear on that. So basically, if you add a phosphate to you know an, an amino acid uh, in a protein, it can affect its activity and things. And as you were saying yourself, David James, fighting like a thousand. So you do ten minutes of exercise, you're getting a thousand different enzymes basically getting mm -hmm. phosphorylated and some of them are getting phosphorylated at more than more than just one site mm -hmm. and you know yeah, the phosphorylation are, i guess is some normally activating but sometimes it's exactly some are default some are activated some are um some are dephosphorylated so actually reducing the phosphorylation mm -hmm. so it gets very complicated doesn't it and we were just oh, talking yeah. earlier why don't you just also mention the other sort of uh, these are called post-translational modifications. So you've already made the protein and then it gets post-translationally modified by adding mm -hmm. a phosphate, removing a phosphate. Why don't we just touch on just how complex things are getting? Um, what else do we know about exercise affecting other sort of ohms? Oh, all the ohms. <laughs> yeah. Well, there are a lot of ohms and, and uh, I mean, there is also, uh, of course, you also affect uh, gene transcription. You have mm -hmm. various genes when you exercise, and that's been well described. But there are also, you know, we are actually also uh, have a paper where we look at ubiquitination of proteins during exercise. And when you when you attach the molecule ubiquitin to another protein, 
then that is usually a death sign so that that leads to degradation of the protein where the ubiquitin has been attached to and mm -hmm. We found with uh, with David and, and Ben Parker that in muscle with exercise, you actually increase the ubiqui ubiquitination of many proteins. And I think that is, is part of the health benefits of exercise because it, it cleans up the muscle. So when you, when you increase ubiquitination, you get rid of a lot of proteins that are probably not uh, or are, that are uh, ready to be degraded. So it's a cleaning mm -hmm. up process that you actually accelerate with exercise. And that is, I think, also very important. There are other ohms, uh, sumoluation, where you attach another molecule, sumo molecule, and that leads to, to changes in the uh, localization of the protein and, and its its properties and so on. We don't know so much about Simulation in in skeletal muscle, but uh, in other organs, it's it 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 regulates a lot of, of uh, protein functions and so on. So there there are many. There's methylation as well, and and uh, other uh, other ohms that we can yeah. probably see in the literature coming up more and more <laughs> in the exercise literature. Yeah. Well, I know with the, you mentioned the ROS and, and, and I mentioned nitric oxide, there's S nitrosylation when you're adding like a nitric oxide, yeah. sort of, there's S glutathionation, there's all these things going on. So I guess what I'm wondering about is, you know, does it, does it sort of get too complicated? Um, Cause I remember years, like 20 years ago or something, when, when everyone started looking at gene arrays, looking at the changes in messenger RNA in the muscle, people like, Oh, that's the end of physiology. Now we don't have to, worry about physiology it's all genes and, and then we found that obviously wasn't the case but now it's like you got your phosphoproteome your esquidothionome gnome your sumulation sumo ohm, whatever it is do you think the store place for you know is this the end of of sort of normal integrative physiology or do you think we still need to sort of work out what's going on by doing sort of integrative physiology experiments well, obviously, that's what I think, being an integrated physiologist myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, molecular biology is great, and, and you get a lot of insight into mechanisms, but you also still want to see how is the body working in, in real life during exercise and so on. So I, uh, we're not going to get rid of uh, integrative physiology <laughs> exercise. Which I, I hope not, exactly. <laughs> at least. But, it, it you know, it, it's... The more you can you can do with molecular biology, the more you get into the mechanisms of what's going on. But if you can, if you can still perform the molecular biology in tissues or blood that come from humans during exercise, mm -hmm. following exercise, different uh, diets or whatever, or that we do here, then I think you're 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 still uh, doing a pretty valuable research because this, the human angle is still, I mean, the most important angle. And then exactly if you can right. combine these two, then I think we are, we are, we are doing well. Well, that's the thing I want to make sure people are clear on. So you mentioned, you know, mouse and diffuse red hind limbs and, and knockout mm -hmm. mice and things, but just how much you do in humans. So why don't you tell, because when I first came over, I was I was doing studies with femoral and femoral vein catheters and muscle biopsies in one leg. Um, why don't you tell them, you know, the, the sort of things you can do and the stuff we've been doing together. Um, so, for example, the first study we did with the NOS inhibitor, why don't you just tell them all the different bits and pieces we did? And it's just amazing. Like, Eric isn't just sort of like setting it up and he just leaves for the rest of the day and then says, what's happening with the data? He's setting it up and he's there the whole day. So why don't you just give a bit of an idea to people of the sort of things we can measure, the contrast and ultrasound and yeah. all sorts of things. Well, sure. Um, so so I've in my research, I've benefited a lot from being a medical doctor because that allows me to do invasive studies. So what we've done with you, for instance, is and we've done in many other studies is to catheterize the legs, both legs, for instance, so you catheterize the femoral artery and the femoral vein, so you can collect blood from the the blood that's going into the leg and the blood that's leaving the leg, and you can then measure AV differences. If you can also measure blood flow, you can, for instance, and you can uh, get a quantitative 
a measure of glucose uptake, lactate release, or whatever else you can measure an AV difference from. Um, then we also take muscle biopsies from the, usually from the vastus lateralis, and uh, that of course is valuable to look at molecular mechanisms in the muscle. We've also done microdialysis uh, with uh, the idea to measure interstitial glucose concentration. And that, of course, has uh, in the study we did together where we manipulated blood flow with the nitric oxide synthase inhibitors. We could see that the uh, interstitial glucose concentration is, is varying quite a lot with the flow. And in that, in, in, in that particular study, we also did a euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp so that we could raise the insulin concentration but keep the blood glucose a constant by infusing insulin. So we had this whole package of, of individuals mm -hmm. that had been exercising with actually one leg only. I mean, that's what we often do because then we mm -hmm. can look at the other leg as a non-exercise control leg. And uh, so when you then uh, look at, at post-exercise insulin sensitivity, you can then look at the two legs and combine the glucose uptake that is going on when you increase the insulin concentration. And we found, as you know, that the uh, interstitial glucose concentration during a clamp actually decreases mm -hmm. quite a lot and decreases more in the uh, in the exercise leg than the rested leg. And that gave us the idea that perhaps you could say this might be a you could you you could use the word an artifact of the uh, the clamp because you are increasing the plasma insulin concentration without increasing the plasma glucose concentration and that is an artificial situation right normally when you eat you increase your insulin uh, concentration because the glucose concentration goes up because you digest the food and you release glucose into the bloodstream and then you activate insulin secretion that doesn't happen during a clamp. So we discussed, you and I, whether whether it would be interesting to do a, a meal instead of a clamp following exercise. And that is uh, not yet published, but I guess it will be published pretty soon. Well, I'm, I'm writing it at the moment, as you know. <laughs> When's that draft going to be ready? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff there to unpack, but um, I want to make sure people are clear because... It was all very well talking about doing that first study, but when we actually, when I actually saw the, the person with all the catheters and things, although as you know, I, I did do it myself as well. So I like to do to people what I've had done myself. So Eric stuck catheters in both my femoral artery and femoral veins, and we looked at glucose uptake and infused nitric oxide synthase inhibitors into both the, the, the rested leg and the exercise leg. So that was pretty amazing. But yeah, you're literally doing, and what you didn't mention as well is um, we did contrast enhanced ultrasound. Oh, so why don't you right, just yeah. say a little bit about that as well? Um, okay, you know, well, that is a yeah. technique where you uh, where you can visualize the capillary perfusion, and it was a technique developed in in uh, in the U.S. I guess it's been in, used in cardiac um, in the clinic uh, for cardiac uh, monitoring, but uh, Eugene Barrett uh, worked with it in muscle, and Michael Clark in. Uh, Hobart and uh, uh, developed it for use in 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 in, uh, in muscle and Steve Radigan was also quite involved mm -hmm. in those studies. So we actually adopted the technique where you actually infuse just intravenously micro bubbles that are the size of a red blood cell, so it can enter the capillaries. So these bubbles can enter the capillaries and. Uh, then you uh, you can image them with ultrasound, and then what happens is that you 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 give a blast of high energy ultrasound, so you destroy all the bubbles in the little region of interest that you're looking at in the thigh, for instance, could be other places, but mm -hmm. we did it in the thigh, and then you can image the refilling of the vascular compartments uh, with the mi micro bubbles following the high energy blast. And that gives you an, an index of capillary perfusion. And, uh, and we were able to show that, that in the exercised leg, the leg that had exercised 
four hours before we did the clamp, the uh, the effect of insulin was actually uh, quite a lot larger, so that the increase in capillary perfusion was significantly higher in the leg that had exercised compared to the leg that hadn't exercised. So, so there's also a very important vascular component of the increased insulin sensitivity following exercise. So you increase the delivery of glucose and you also, uh, of course, have the, the increased GLUT4 translocation in the muscle that has exercised. But in the clamp, as, as we just talked about it, it the delivery is, uh, is apparently not enough to keep the interstitial glucose concentration up. So it falls. But if you do a, a meal where you get hyperglycemia as well as hyperinsulinemia, we found that the interstitial glucose actually goes up, which is what mm -hmm. you would expect. But it also leads to a much higher glucose uptake, particularly in the exercise leg where there's a large capacity for glucose transport into the muscle and also glucose dis disposition uh, 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 to right. take care of the glucose that is coming into the muscle. All right. So there's a lot of stuff there. And obviously what you and me have been sort of living and breathing all this stuff. So I might just make sure people are clear and, and just the really cool stuff as well. So as I said, the first subject we did, we had seven catheters in here. Yeah. Yeah. So but femoral artery and femoral vein of both legs. And then we had a catheter to infuse the microbubbles for the contrast and ultrasound, as you said, um, for, for muscle blood flow. So you're not just getting leg, but you're getting the muscle blood flow. And then we had the catheter for infusing glucose and insulin. And then, believe it or not, you'd think, you know, because you've got femoral artery and femoral vein in there, you could measure arterial blood. But we couldn't because we were infusing a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor at times into the femoral artery to block the flow. So we had to have a catheter in the hand and heat the hand to get arterialized glucose samples. <laughs> and um, anyway, it, it was quite funny because when you were first putting the catheters in, I was like, to me, it, it, you know, it felt pretty heavy having that many catheters going in. And I was like, ah, oh, Eric does all this all the time. And then you actually said, well, you don't normally because you normally do one femoral artery um, mm -hmm. and then both femoral veins because you can you know, assume obviously the artery is it's the same concentration in both which is obviously correct. But because we were infusing NOS inhibitor, you couldn't get a sample from the right. femoral artery. Yeah. Okay, so that was that. And then we had the biopsies, yeah? So three biopsies from each leg, rest of the leg, exercise leg. Anyway, so just make sure people are clear. So basically what, what we find, you do the one leg exercise, you wait three or four hours for the, for the glucose uptake and the blood flow to go back to normal. So it's the same in both legs. You do the clamp, as you said, infuse glucose and insulin. You find the glucose uptakes higher in the previously exercised leg. Also, the insulin signaling is higher in the previously exercised leg. Um, but then the, the really novel thing, I guess, is when we gave the NOS inhibitor and prevented the blood flow effect, because it's a it's a as a constrictor, you could prevent the insulin sensitizing effect. Yeah. So it kind of showed you need the insulin signaling and right. you need the flow. Is that is that fair enough? Yeah, it's fair enough. All right. So just making sure people are on the same page and then we can get to the meal. So, because you were saying a lot of stuff there that, so as we showed though, that the, the glucose levels in the, in the interstitium dropped because the muscles like sucking up so much, especially the exercise leg, that the glucose levels actually drop in the interstitium, which mm. is what's sort of bathing the fibers. Yeah. And then maybe uh, if you don't mind, just say again that the idea with the meal, because I just think we might have lost a few people there and then we could talk a bit more about that. Um, well, I mean, so, so in, in the meal, you, of course, if you give a, and we gave a fairly carbohydrate-rich meal, but not only carbohydrate, it was a, a normal meal, but, but with, uh, I guess, 55 or 60% carbohydrates or so, then it was a pretty large meal, and you get a large increase in glucose, plasma glucose from five and a half millimolar, which is what you have in the fasting state, up to around nine nine and a half millimolar at the, at the peak. So that's a fairly large increase in glucose. And that actually uh, then stimulates the pancreas to secrete endogenous insulin. So we actually reached concentrations of insulin that were around 100 microunits per ml, which is what we normally 
use mm -hmm. when we camp people. So it was about the same. So I was kind of fortunate and that was, of mm -hmm. course, our, our goal, but we were happy to see that we actually reached mm -hmm. the goal. Mm -hmm. So with this, uh, and, and also in this situation, the blood flow increased uh, with the meal, as you might expect, because insulin is a vasodilator and it increased more in the exercise leg compared to the rested mm -hmm. leg. So you have this large delivery of glucose because the glucose concentration is very high. You have an increased blood flow, not a lot, but a bit. And then you have the high insulin and that creates ideal conditions for taking up glucose into the muscle. And 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 it looked like and 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 so the difference we found that the difference between the leg that had exercised beforehand compared to the rested leg was actually quite a lot larger than what we've seen previously with the clamp, where we have euglycemia, normal glucose concentration. Mm -hmm. And that was mainly because the exercise leg was able to take up a lot more glucose when we had hyper hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia than during the clamp where you have low or these normal plasma glucose. Whereas in the rested mm -hmm. leg, the glucose uptake was not really increased that much compared to what we would expect with such a high glucose concentration. So it actually looked like in also in the muscle biopsies that there was a, a problem in the rested leg handling all the glucose. So it was sort of being a it was not being able to to be disposed into the glycogen pool uh, in the rested leg, whereas in the exercise leg, you could get rid of all the glucose coming in. So you didn't have any accumulation of glucose, which we saw in the rested mm -hmm. leg. So the rested leg was yeah. not really able to handle all the delivered glucose uh, very well. So it sort of got stuck <laughs> as, as glucose in, in the muscle and was not further metabolized to the same extent. Mm -hmm as in the exercise leg. Yeah, and that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? So um, as you said, so when you do a clamp, you see the glucose uptake keeps going over the next two or three hours, whatever you do the clamp for in both the legs. But we found with the meal, they the exercise and the rest of the leg went up about the same for the first 15 minutes. And then the, the rest of the leg just stopped. Oh, sorry, it just stayed the same. Mm. And the exercise leg went, kept going up. And it was like about double, which is more yeah. than what you get in a clamp. So as you as you say, it looked like there was actually some sort of inhibition. Well, it's not like it's inhibition makes you think it's been reduced, but it just sort of stayed the same, yeah. Because as you said, the the free glucose in the muscle went up, and the glucose six phosphate went up. So glucose gets phosphorylated, as we said earlier, to glucose six phosphate, and that wasn't sort of getting shuttled off. It was just sort of accumulating a bit, so maybe inhibiting. Uh, mm. further glucose uptake. So again, very different to the clamp. So what do we say, therefore, you mentioned the word artifact, and we've sort of bandied that around a bit when we've been chatting about it. What do you make of this? So as, as you know, we've talked about, I'm going to be writing a um, perspective on, on you know, meals versus clamps, and what do, what do we take away, and what do we have to consider with the clamp, and do people need to think more about this and that? So what, what do you, can you sort of just elaborate on that a little bit? Um, well, yeah. I mean, so, so the, the great thing about the clamp, of course, is that you have steady state conditions. You have, you have constant glucose, you have constant insulin. And that is really nice if you want to make uh, measurements of insulin sensitivity, steady state. In the meal, you don't have steady state. You have constantly changing plasma glucose going up and going down. You have insulin going up and going down. So that is more difficult to you i mean you don't have steady state and therefore it's a much more dynamic system and you have to interpret the findings differently from from the clamp because you don't have steady state which, which is really necessary if you want to get a, a good measure of insulin sensitivity uh, mm -hmm. but on the other hand in real life you don't have a clamp you have meals and you, have, you ingest carbohydrates or whatever you ingest. So the meal study is more a model of what happens during everyday life. Uh, and it, it can still be used to, to look at insulin action, but you just have to be aware of that you don't have steady state. So it's not a 
it's not a, a, a real measure of insulin sensitivity as such as what you can get with the clamp. So yep. you have to and, consider and the differences. I guess we just have to make sure people are clear. So instead of doing a clamp, we were just doing a meal. So we still had the same, you know, femoral artery, femoral vein, but they just had a meal. I guess um, people at home or whatever can't sort of go off and do that. So the other thing I guess is, you know, we've talked about continuous glucose monitoring and we even had that at the start of the study. We were mucking around with that because, you know, continuous glucose monitoring measures interstitial glucose, but it's just, you know, in the fat, we were measuring interstitial glucose, you know, three inches down in the muscle and they don't, aren't necessarily the same. Um, do you think it's something, um, you know, that people could think about doing here and there if they were interested, especially, I, mean, I know people with diabetes, but, you know, some people were all over the place that's saying, oh, you know, everyone should be doing their continuous glucose monitoring. They shouldn't be getting these glucose spikes. Try and stop glucose spikes as much as you can. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on any of that stuff? I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess it depends a lot who you are. Obviously, if you're a type 1 diabetic, it's very useful to use uh, continuous glucose monitoring. That's That's for sure. For people that do not have diabetes, I mean, if you want to measure, uh, follow your glucose and you are maybe uh, insulin uh, uh, resistant, overweight and so on, maybe it's a good idea to um, try to prevent too many spikes in, in plasma mm -hmm. glucose. So you can, you can use it for that. But if you are a normal uh, young person who is physically active, uh, not overweight, I, I don't see the big, the big, uh, need for it but of course it gives you information on of on your body so if you're one of those people that really like to know what's going on in your body during everyday mm -hmm. life and, during, and if you're exercising you want to know am i getting hypoglycemic or what what's going on and mm -hmm. then fine I've, I've used it myself a few times just to see yeah. uh, just to see what's going on and it, i mean it's fun to see and every time it you eat fun. you see you see the little, <laughs> little spike and then it goes down and you can see that during the night you actually get mm -hmm. quite uh, low levels actually down to around three mm -hmm. millimolar even yeah. though you're not yep. you're not taking any medicine or anything like that so yeah i think it it's fun really but... <laughs> remember <laughs> but, last uh... time I, remember <laughs> last time i was here in 2019 I, I had this idea in my head to see what happened if i fasted for five days and i, st and I was still exercising every day and one day I got home for the uh, back to the lab and I almost collapsed. And I said, like, okay, it's time to stop this. Um, yeah. Now, there's a question on um, on Twitter that feeds in with this. Uh, Mark asked, to what extent are the exercise-induced increases in glucose disposal attributed to an increased incretin effect and or glucose effectiveness? So that feeds in with what we've been doing with the meal. So maybe, you know, the clamp, you're not really getting that. That Maybe explain what incretins are. That's okay first and then... Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, incretins are, are are gut hormones that are released upon uh, eating something, um, and and the most known ones are GLP one and uh, glucose GIP, and uh, we we actually measured them also in the uh, in the meal study that we've been talking about, and and sure enough, they go up quite a lot. And uh, does it play a role for glucose uptake? Mm, we don't know, but actually uh, at least GLP-1, we've showed that in a study uh, 10 years ago, that if you infuse GLP-1 into a leg, you see that it actually increases uh, blood flow. So it is is uh, has some vascular properties that are probably participating in the effect of insulin on the vasculature during during a meal so in that respect they might play a role but but they don't in in that study that we did where we infused glp1 we did not see any increase in glucose uptake per se so mm -hmm. glp1 is not able to increase glucose uptake as such directly on the muscle, but it actually is a vasodilator, so it increases blood flow. Not a lot, but it is uh, similar to what insulin can do. So if you have the vascular, if the, uh, the vasodilated dilated effect of insulin, and the, on top of that, the vasodilation on, of GLP-1, then maybe that will increase or get, get more uh, vasodilation, and then hence 
also increase delivery of glucose uh, following a meal. So in that respect, it might play a role, but it doesn't have a direct effect on muscle glucose uptake. All right. So just thinking about, uh, we've talked about acute exercise, but exercise training. So we know exercise training increases insulin sensitivity of, of muscle. And um, and again, there's been some studies with people with type 2 diabetes, but probably not, as, not that many. Just wondering if you could talk a bit about the effect of the acute bout versus the chronic effects. You know, is it is it is the effect of training just the last bout of exercise or is there like an additive hmm. training effect? Well, it's it's a good question. <laughs> and you can you can say that if you train regularly, you will often be in the post exercise phase, right? So you will still have the acute effects of the last exercise bout. But in addition to that, when you're exercise training, you will create uh, changes in the muscle that also lead to increased insulin sensitivity. And those are, for instance, increased uh, GLUT4 protein expression. So when you have a trained muscle, you get more GLUT4, so you can move more uh, glucose transporters uh, to the surface membrane. You also get more hexokinase, which is the enzyme that phosphorylates glucose when it comes into the muscle. And that, of course, helps disposing of the glucose so it doesn't accumulate as, as free glucose. So that is also a, an important finding in the trained muscle. You also get an increased capillarization with the training so that you probably have better supply of glucose and, and maybe also insulin in the trained muscle. So you get a lot of chronic changes in the muscle that are conducive to increased insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. and those will last for longer time uh, maybe weeks or maybe even yeah weeks probably a few weeks uh, so so when you are exercise training and you you look at insulin sensitivity you have to to think about well Am I in the? Am I both well trained and in the post exercise phase, or am I further away from the last training bout? So it's only the effect of training that I'm uh, seeing. So, um, so those are two different things because the acute bouts of exercise do not change the gene expression. They 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 change the gene expression, but it's not something that is uh, strong enough to change the protein uh, content of the muscle. So that for that, you need several bouts of exercise so that you get changes in the protein content of the muscle. For instance, good for hexokinase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, and I've got a question here um, from Mark again. I think I mentioned Mark. Are there differences uh, in the chronic increased muscle insulin sensitivity between performing regular resistance training or aerobic type training. So I guess we tend to, you know, the one legged kicking things we do, et cetera, is like an hour. It's more endurance exercise. Mm -hmm. um, resistance training. And it makes me think about um, that paper we were both on with Jan Wojciechowski, who's been on the, on the, um, on the podcast as well. I, I used to always say, well, as long as you're breaking down glycogen, you're going to get an increase in insulin sensitivity. But we, we, we kind of know that it's maybe not that simple, right? <laughs> mm. Yeah, so so Jan made the effort to uh, actually look at, at all the clamps that we've been doing over the last 20 years here in this, uh, in this <laughs> department. And he collected 13 studies and looked at whether there was a correlation. 13 studies that had fairly similar protocol, one leg exercise, and then uh, clamp afterwards. And then you could correlate the increase in insulin sensitivity following exercise with the breakdown of glycogen during exercise, because we also took muscle biopsies to measure glu uh, glycogen. And in those 13 studies, when he put all those data together in a meta analysis, there was surprisingly no correlation between the increased mm. insulin sensitivity and the glycogen breakdown or the glycogen content per se. We actually expected that there would be, like you, uh, <laughs> that there would be a correlation, but but that wasn't the case. 
you know, now the interesting thing about this meta analysis that, that uh, was published fairly recently in diabetes, the journal diabetes, was that there, as we know, there's a huge variability between in individual insulin sensitivity, even in a group of people. So we've usually studied young, fairly young males that are recreationally active. So they're not obese, they're not athletes, but just regular students mostly that use their bicycle for local transportation around Copenhagen and so on. And even though they're fairly similar in body composition and VO2 max and so on, there's a huge individual variation in the insulin sensitivity that we can measure with the clamp. So that's quite quite uh, interesting to try to figure out why why is there this big uh, change or this big difference in uh, insulin sensitivity in the in these individuals and and in that paper we were also able to show that that uh, the increase in insulin sensitivity that you get with exercise with similar bouts of exercise in all these 13 studies was also quite variable. So some people gain a lot of insulin sensitivity when mm -hmm. they exercise, some gain very little. What the reason for that is, is not really that well known at the, at the moment. But of course, interesting yeah. to figure out um, so that you can sort of get person personalized physiology, personalized maybe the foundation for personalized medicine, which is very popular these days to figure out what are the individual differences that that actually uh, are, are important for your insulin sensitivity. What is mm -hmm. it in the muscle that is so important for us? That some have very high insulin sensitivity, some have very low insulin sensitivity. So that's an ongoing research question, and particularly Jan is, is mm -hmm. following that route. It is really surprising, isn't it? Because just like we were talking about with ABK, you know, you get ACAR, which activates ABK, increases glucose uptake. So therefore you'd think it would be, you know, playing a role in exercise. Well, the same thing with exercise increases glycogen synthase activity. So it's wanting to take up glucose and synthesize glycogen, but it's not necessarily increasing glycogen. Well, I guess, did he actually look, he probably hasn't looked at that, whether, you know, the people that have the low glucose uptake also have lower activation of glycogen synthase or whatever i guess they haven't done yeah, that. yeah. Um, but that's not the case that's not the no case. and i guess the, i guess it also makes sense in a way because athletes have elevated endurance athletes have elevated muscle glycogen but they also have higher insulin hmm. sensitivity so i guess it means there's more there's more going on so yeah, yeah. so back right. so back with the okay so Resistant. So if people are just wondering, right. oh, what's best for my increase in insulin sensitivity? Should I do endurance or weight training? I mean, what do you think they both do? Well, I mean, both both forms of exercise increase your insulin sensitivity. And I guess probably I would, I would, I don't think it's been really uh, compared very uh, accurately, but I we know that both resistance exercise and endurance exercise increases insulin sensitivity. I would assume that endurance does it more because you get more capillarization and you get you don't get big fibers, which might not be the best for insulin sensitivity. But resistance exercise actually also increases sensitivity, insulin sensitivity. So you can choose what you want. You can choose what you feel is best for you mm, and what, exactly. you, what you actually do. So if 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 people ask what kind of exercise should I do. The answer is do any exercise and the one that you like the most. Exactly that right. Is, that is what I would say at least. <laughs> I guess the other thing with chronic, so you know, training with um, resistance training is you get the increase in lean, lean mass. So you have more muscle as well, I guess. So yeah. it's a different sort of different kettle of fish. Talking about exercising, what about you? Do you do uh, much exercise? <laughs> I know you do. I know the answer, but I'm just asking. You. Well, yeah, as you should know, I bike to work every day, so that's seven kilometers in and seven kilometers out. Then I run a bit in in uh, in the uh, in the week on the weekends or bike. And uh, I'm pretty proud of actually that that uh, I'm able to run five k's 
in 25 minutes, which is, I think, pretty decent in uh, considering the age that I have reached now. And we're not allowed to ask what age you've reached. It's, it's rude. So I'm going to ask that. I've got another question here from Martin on Twitter. Is there a relationship between hit uh, hyperglycemia and appetite regulation. So I guess we were talking uh, earlier about if you do high intensity exercise, you can get an increase in glucose, which is mm. called hyperglycemia. So is there a relationship between hit hyperglycemia and appetite regulation? Hmm. Oh, well, interesting question. Um, well, what can I say? I mean, it's it's pretty well known that if you do high intensity exercise, then afterwards you are not hungry, at least for a while. So there is some mm. some uh, exercise-induced uh, diminishing of your appetite. And then you, of course, get the appetite later. But it, it, takes, uh, it can take quite a while, and it depends on how, how high intensity you do and how long you do it, of course. Yeah, so that's pretty well described, and, and we don't really know the mechanism, but probably it's not so much the glucose because if you if you just elevate the glucose in a in a clamp by infusing more glucose than you actually dispose of then it doesn't seem to affect appetite very much but there could be other okay. other mechanisms for instance uh, we we collaborated with uh, Jonathan Long at Stanford and he's uh, interested in in this uh, in this substance called LACFI and published a nice paper in Nature about LACFI. And LACFI is actually, so when you exercise at high intensity, you make a lot of lactate, that's well known. And lactate can be can be fused to phenylalanine, hence the name LACFI. So it's a, it's a fusion product. And there's an enzyme that does that. And if you uh, synthesize LACFI in the lab, and then inject it into a mouse, then you'll see that the mouse will eat less than it does if you don't inject it or in, you inject just a vehicle. So it looks like like fee has some appetite regulating uh, effects. Mm. And we've also shown, we, we collaborated with them and in some of our studies where we, we actually did three Wingate tests in our subjects where really high intensity exercise uh, repeated, we reached lactate levels around 15 millimolars. And in those experiments, we also saw, so we sent the blood to Jonathan Long and he could measure that lac fee was really increased quite remarkably. So of course, if you, if you do high intensity exercise, you produce a lot of lactate, you get lac fee and that will probably affect your appetite. Oh, we don't know in humans because we haven't done infusion studies and stuff, but at least if you extrapolate from the mouse, that could be one of the reasons that you feel less hungry after high intensity exercise. There are the yeah, hormones that might play a role. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of interest in lactate nowadays. Um, obviously George Brooks has been interested in lactate for a long time. I've been trying to get him on the podcast actually, and he's not, he hasn't come, yeah. come on yet, but um Lactate seems to be doing all sorts of things. So I think it's fair to say lactate isn't just as baddy. You know, people probably think yeah, if they no, could no. take a pill and get rid of lactate, they'd be happier. But um... Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so, I mean, there are other things like the GDF15, growth and differentiation factor 15 that we've worked with for quite a while now. And that also increases the uh, plasma concentration of GDF15 increases during exercise in humans as well as in mice. And if you if you inject GDF15 into an obese mouse, you will also see that it affects the appetite. So the mouse will eat less and it will uh, lose weight. So that could also be a way uh, that exercise actually diminishes your appetite, especially if you do high intensity exercise. Wow. Okay. Um, so the other another one that what the person that asked Martin the question about hit hypoglycemia and appetite along these lines, and you were just talking about losing weight, how is energy status impacting glucose metabolism and insulin? So he talks about REDS, so um, relative energy deficiency in sport. So I guess, and we we touched on this a bit before we came on air. Do you want to just talk a little bit about? Um, you know, fasting or, or eating insufficiently and what effect that has on metabolism. 
Well, um, obviously, if you if you intake less calories than you expend, then you will lose weight. Mm. And uh, of course, the most dramatic way to lose weight is to to fast. And if you don't eat anything, and we know that that maybe contrary to what you might expect, then fasting actually leads to insulin resistance, quite dramatic insulin resistance. So you could see that's probably a a good a good way of getting insulin resistant because it's it's physiological and it protects your carbohydrate stores from being used too much and it's a it's a maybe a a different way of getting insulin resistant compared to people that are overweight or obese and and some of them have type two diabetes. I don't know. I mean, they're also insulin resistant. Whether that's a protective mechanism can also be mm-hmm. thought of because you sort of protect the organism from storing even more glucose uh, in in tissues that are maybe not uh, suited to store glucose. Like like you get a lot of of, uh, of adipose uh, tissue growth, of course, if you are eating more than you you spend. So. That's maybe a different form of, of insulin resistance. But of course, if you just cut your your energy status or your energy intake to not being fasting, but just uh, decreasing it, I don't really know what happens to uh, to insulin sensitivity. Um, it, I guess it depends on how, how much you cut. <laughs> and we know, of course, mm-hmm. from females that, that many females, they are... Uh, having problems with uh, energy deficiency and, and affecting their menstrual cycle and all that. Um, so whether that's the same in males, uh, I you could you could speculate that your uh, production of of male hormones might be uh, affected by decreasing your energy intake. Um, I don't know. We we actually did a study. I it was actually Ben De Keens who was the pioneer where we, many years ago, where she had individuals that substituted their protein source from animal sources to vegetables protein. So the same amount of protein in the diet, but either animal protein or vegetable protein. And the guys, these were young men, and they uh, they uh, did had this diet for five weeks, I think. And one of the the findings that were a little bit surprising were that if you eat, if you substitute your proteins from animals' proteins to vegetables, you actually lower your testosterone concentration. And that might not be very good if you are an athlete, a uh, male athlete. So um, that's just a consideration. But 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 just. Uh, what it does to metabolism to cut your energy intake. I mean, obviously you lose weight and you increase your lipolysis and so on because you're energy deficient. It would probably lead to decreased insulin action, I would assume, just like fasting does. It's interesting yeah. that, because um, you mentioned how fasting uh, can make you insulin resistant, it may be to, to maintain your carbohydrate levels. Because people often assume that... Um, when you're fasting, you know, you, you're losing this weight at the start because your glycogen is getting broken down and there's, you know, two or three grams of water being stored with every gram of glycogen. But when you fast, you know, unless you're exercising, your glycogen doesn't really change for the first two or three, four days. Not in the muscle, but in the liver it does. <laughs> oh, sorry, of course. Sorry, I'm a bit muscle-centric. Yeah. Yes, in the liver, absolutely. But you're um, right. I mean, and, and if you're overweight or obese and you cut your energy intake, then you lose weight, and that is has... A, clearly been shown in all, a lot of studies that you that increases your insulin sensitivity yep, yep. but that's when you're coming from an overweight state to a, a less overweight state so if you are normal weight and you cut your energy intake yeah i don't know um, exactly if that would increase or decrease your insulin sensitivity mm-hmm. probably okay. depends on how much you cut if you're mm-hmm. cutting a lot, so you are getting close to uh, fasting, then you'll probably get resistant. I guess it would make a difference if you're exercising or not as well. So if you're losing mm-hmm. the weight through exercise, I, I'm assuming that would increase because exercise increases your insulin sensitivity. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And I, 
And I guess that's what we're designed to do, right? We're meant to be actually physically active, hunter, hunter and gathering. Hmm. Um, the so. state that we're in nowadays is not normal. And, and this, no, sometimes no, no. people talk, you know, Frank Booth, for example, talks about um, if you have a rat on a running wheel, you know, rather than that being like the exercise train rat, that should be your hmm. normal rat. And then the that's one that right. hasn't got the running wheel is the sedentary one. Right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, the increased insulin sensitivity in muscle after exercise makes perfectly sense physiologically because then, then that allows you to direct the glucose into the muscles that have been active and that have broken down their glycogen. So even though glycogen in itself doesn't seem to affect insulin sensitivity, then it is important to be able to resynthesize your glycogen stores following yeah, exercise absolutely. so you're ready ready for the next exercise bout yeah all right great now one you one you actually mentioned the other day would be a good one to talk about was the very interesting question of how glucose escapes metabolism in gut cells and for instance <laughs> kidney where it is absorbed slash reabsorbed what were you what's that about well uh, that's because i've i've been involved in writing a review with uh, some people that i knowledgeable about how glucose is actually handled in other tissues in the body. And one of the, the really uh, intriguing questions is that uh, when, you, when you eat carbohydrates and you, you absorb glucose into the intestinal cell, and then of course the glucose comes out on the basolateral membrane and goes into the bloodstream. That's, of course, well known. That's why we see an increase in glucose. But when you think about it, then the epithelial cell in the gut takes up glucose and then somehow has to transport it through the cell and have it leaving the cell without being metabolized. Because in the muscle, we mm -hmm. know that when glucose comes in, it is phosphorylated immediately, and then it's further metabolized, either stored as glycogen or oxidized. But that is mm -hmm. not what you want in an epithelial mm -hmm. cell in the gut, because you want it to traverse the cell without being phosphorylated or metabolized. It could be phosphorylated, but you don't want it further metabolized. So that is really a, an interesting question. How does the cell actually avoid the metabolism of the glucose that comes in because uh, the the gut cell does have hexokinase so it can phosphorylate the muscle the glucose so so what is what is thought is that that maybe it's phosphorylated and then there is a, 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 a glucose 6 phosphatase that is also a transporter that transports it into the into this uh, so the endo, endoplasmatic reticulum, uh -huh. the endoplasmatic reticulum in the cell, and then it is chaperoned towards the basolateral membrane of the uh, gut cell, and it then somehow escapes through mm -hmm. the bas basolateral uh, route, and and that has been thought to be GLUT2 glucose transporter two that does okay, that too. job. But mm -hmm. there are actually uh, uh, knockout studies where people have knocked out GLUT2 glut and still the transport mechanism seems to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's some of it probably leaves through GLUT2, but some of it may leave via some process that we don't really understand that well from, from the endoplasmatic reticulum maybe some vesicles or something that fused with the basolateral membrane and somehow lets the glucose escape because it's probably not going between, it's not going between the cells, it's going through the actual cells. The same conundrum is actually in the kidney where you reabsorb mm -hmm. glucose from the, from the blood and somehow, or from the urine and then you, you want it to be reabsorbed into the blood. So there is a lot of of uh, mm. good questions there that are that to some extent are known, but but I think there are a lot of there's still some knowledge gaps in how glucose actually evades metabolism in those cells mm. that actually uh, can transport it through the cell. Quite interesting. That's interesting. 
it makes me think of it's different, but it makes me think of um, you know, when you have a meal and, and you glucose is absorbed and then you assume it to be taken up by the liver, but the liver doesn't really take up glucose. I know it's different because you're talking about going through cells, but it goes sort of straight through the liver. A lot of it doesn't get taken up in the first pass. And it's called like the the indirect pathway. Um, it just makes me think of that anyway. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. when, when you have a meal, you assume that it's going, the glucose going through the portal vein would be taken up by the liver, but it tend, a lot of it tends to go straight through. And then gives the periphery a shot at it. Mm. Yeah, that's right. and and the funny thing is, or the interesting thing is that after exercise, it looks like a larger part of the glucose that is absorbed when you when you eat is actually escaping uh, liver metabolism. So that some mechanism exists, so that you can you bypass the liver, and that is probably because you need it to replenish your glycogen stores in the muscles. Uh, Maybe exactly. Before the yeah. And it's great you mentioned that because that's a that's a misunderstanding some people have. So I think was it was it Rose? It was Mark Hargraves, maybe Kirsten Heller. You know, people sometimes that you do like an oral glucose tolerance test. So you drink 75 yeah. grams of glucose after exercise, you actually get a greater increase in glucose than you get um, at rest. And people go, Oh, that means you're you know glucose intolerant. Mm. But as you say, you actually want that, right? You want the glucose to get through to give the muscle the first shot at it. Mm. Yeah, That's right. cool. All right. Um, and, and also just talking about the glucose transport, it reminded me of, you know, what we've been talking about with this, with, with a with a meal and with a clamp, the fact that the glucose has to get from the blood into the interstitium. Mm -hmm. And I know you've done some work on this, that, you know, is it going through cells or is it going through slits? Did we not just talk about that briefly in, in, in the knockout study you did, et cetera? Yeah, so, so in, in the muscle... So, so when you have glucose in the blood, in the capillaries, obviously to get into the muscle, you have to leave the capillary and get into the interstitial space and then into the muscle. So the question has been, how does glucose in the muscle leave the capillaries? It's quite different in the brain compared to the muscle, but, but that's another story. In the muscle, it was shown uh, in the 50s already that that small molecules like glucose, urea, fructose can exit muscle capillaries through some slits or pores, or at least some sort of openings between the endothelial cells. So it's like a sieve. So it, it, it lets small molecules just run through the holes in the in the in the capillaries and that's uh, of course very nice and very efficient and and but there were some some quite interesting studies um, performed in the 70s actually by Christian Krone where they actually injected labeled D glucose and the uh, and L glucose which is the isomer of of glucose of, of the normal glucose. The normal glucose is D-glucose. And then they injected it into the cat muscle as a perfused uh, cat muscle and looked at the outflow curves for both D and L-glucose. And if it was, if glucose only leaves by the slits, then there would be no difference in the uh, exit in the outflow mm. curves of D and L glucose because they are the same size and they can go through the same holes and that would mm. be it. But there was actually a small difference. It was not very large, but there was a little difference so that D glucose actually left the capillaries a little bit better than L glucose. Okay. And if that's only due to to a hole in the, in the membrane or to, to slits between mm. the cells, then that wouldn't happen. So somehow there seems to be a slight preference, and and we know that uh, that the endothelial cells in in muscle and in all other organs actually express another glucose transporter called GLUT1. And the idea was then, well, maybe this GLUT1 is making the difference, so that the difference between D and L glucose could be that GLUT1 is transporting some of the glucose into the capillary cell and then releasing it on the other side into the interstitial mm -hmm. via these glucose transporters. Um, 
not a not a very important effect, but it could be explaining why there was a small difference between DNL glucose. Mm -hmm. So so we together with Catherine de Buck in Zurich, uh, we did a study in uh, endothelial specific inducible GLUT1 knockout mice. So you knock out GLUT1 specifically in the endothelial cells in the mouse. And then you then we looked at uh, the interstitial glucose concentration with microdialysis in the mouse. And it was quite quite a difficult difficult task. And uh, Kim Kim Schubert was really instrumental in making this work. So we actually were able to do microdialysis in a little mouse muscle uh, while it was uh, sedated. And then we did a clamp to increase the <laughs> increase the glucose uh, transport from the blood to the to the muscle or increase the glucose uptake in the muscle and if glut one was important we would assume that the interstitial space would decrease more in the glut one knockout mice than in the control mice but that was not the case okay so that says that glucose in for all practical purposes leaves the skeletal muscle capillaries via the slits that are between the, the cells and it's not a glucose transporter phenomenon even though i mean so you can then ask why do the glucose or the end why do the endothelial cells have glucose transporters that's because they mm. are very glycolytic and they use the glucose for their own metabolism but they, they don't they don't transport mm -hmm. it. okay so that's really interesting so you know we've talked about the interstitial glucose drops in the muscle, especially after exercise when you do a clamp, um, and but not after a meal. So it seems like when your glucose is five millimole, that's not enough. And it doesn't just flow through these slits and maintain five. It's actually not enough, that that transport. But when it's when you have a meal and it goes up to, I think we got 9.4 is the highest. And, but anyway, it's elevated. That's enough to maintain or even increase yeah. interstitial glucose so it's a little yeah. bit fine balance there yeah 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 exactly okay well thank you very much eric we've taken a lot of, of your valuable time and what i'd like to do is finish up with some sort of takeaway messages um from from our chat today what, what are what i don't know two, one two three four takeaway messages from today you'd like people to get oh um well what can i say <laughs> <laughs> you see, exercise uh, increases glucose uptake in a muscle uh, in a, with mechanisms that are independent of insulin. Mm -hmm. So exercise works without insulin to increase muscle glucose uptake. Um, you, the muscle becomes more insulin sensitive after exercise. Uh, it lasts for hours, maybe even a day, a day or even maybe two days. So that insulin works better in a muscle that has exercised. Um, and that is, of course, good because that funnels glucose into the muscle that has been exercising. But it's also clinically relevant because you can increase insulin sensitivity in conditions with decreased insulin action. So in, in insulin resistant patients with diabetes or obesity and so on. Um, well, what what more? <laughs> <laughs> that's probably yeah. that's probably the main the main thing. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you again for coming on, and I'd like to thank you for for your collaboration and friendship and all that. Having me over four times, you're probably slightly over it. Although you did say the other day, maybe you could come back and do another study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now you're okay. always welcome, man. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah. See thank you. you. Bye bye. You. Bye. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.